Hi, good afternoon, Naresh. Hi, Vidya. Hi, how are you? Good, thanks. All right, ready for today's lecture? Yes, that's right. <laughs> Right, it's uh, 10 minutes left. I think we're going to start at one. Yes, that's right. I'll just uh, hide in the background and then when you're ready, just let me know. <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you. Bro. No, I just wanted to check that uh, the Zoom was working. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's good. <laughs> yeah.
All right, Professor Norris, it's now 1 p.m. Do you want to start now or we are still waiting for other students or participants? Um, I'm ready to start anytime. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, maybe I would like to give a little bit of introduction about this uh, program before and then you can go with your lectures. Uh, is it okay. all right? Or Okay. All right, thank you. Uh, all right, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Visiting Professor Lecture Series on Organic Chemistry held by Department of Chemistry Education, Universitas Pendidikan Indonesia, or UP for short. We are very honored to have Professor Naresh Kumar from University of New South Wales, Sydney, who will deliver 10 lectures, right? <laughs> starting today and the whole lectures will be uh, will end in December so make sure you already mark your calendar so you won't miss this great opportunity to learn from Professor Nares. All right this program is fully supported by Ministry of Education, Culture, Research and Technology through the world-class university grant and in this semester we have a total of five visiting lecturers coming from different countries and different fields of expertise. Uh, they are organic chemistry and then computational chemistry and physical chemistry, chemistry education and analytical chemistry. So if you want to join other lectures, you can go and visit our website, Departemen Pendidikan Kimia OP, or you can go to our Instagram or maybe YouTube channel if you want to know more about this uh, professor visiting professor lecture series. All right, and today's lecture is actually part of organic course for master student in our department that is selected topics on organic chemistry. And Professor Norris already picked special topic about drug discovery and development, especially about structure and properties of successful drugs. Yes, uh, Professor Norris will be talking about uh, these successful drugs uh, in short. And also, I know you are yeah. waiting for Professor Norris to give his lectures, but uh, first of all, uh, please allow me to uh, introduce our lecturer to you. So here I would like to share you um, Professor Norris' uh, CV. All right. Oh, I'm sorry. So now Professor Norris is, uh, is now sharing your screen. Oh, I All right. Sorry, I can stop sharing. All that. right. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So, um, all right. Yeah, just, yeah, a little bit introduction of Professor Norris. So he's now currently teaching in the School of Chemistry, UNSW, Sydney. He graduated from University of Wollongong, Australia in medicinal chemistry. And Professor Norris, um, uh, concerned about design and synthesis of bioactive molecules. Uh, he developed quorum sensing inhibitors and designed and developed of novel small molecular antimicrobial peptide mimics or SMAMP. And Professor Norris has age index of 36. And yeah, he, yeah, these are some book chapters and journal articles uh, from Professor Norris. He wrote about uh, nitric oxide donors, novel biomedical applications. And he, and these are the recent articles from Professor Norris about, again, antibacterial agents and uh, new heterogeneous catalyst for production of biodiesel. And then um, he also uh, wrote uh, articles in the clinical potential of antimicrobial peptide. So uh, today we will know more about the structure and then uh, what are the properties of successful drugs from Professor Norris. All right, Professor Norris, please uh, welcome. You can uh, give your lecture now. Thank you, Professor Norris, for your time. Thanks, uh, thanks, Vidya, for a kind introduction. It's really uh, my pleasure to present this these lectures uh, at your university. Uh, I was gonna say, uh, Selamat Siang. 
<laughs> because that's right. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's probably one o'clock at your place, but in Sydney it's 5 p.m. So yes. we are four hours uh, ahead of you in time. Um, but I will uh, try to make sure that I will uh, do my best in terms of um, in terms of presenting the lecture so that you can follow uh, clearly what I want to say. Okay. I'm just trying to get a pen if I can. Uh, okay, I got a pen so I can highlight things as I go along. First of all, I also want to acknowledge one of my colleagues who, uh, who was kind enough to share uh, some of his lecture slides with me as well. So that some of the slides are, are, are from my colleague, uh, Robert Merritt in, in the US. So what we're gonna talk about is two topics today. One is uh, structure and properties of successful drugs. That's one part I'm gonna talk about. And also I'm gonna talk about some biological targets of drugs as well, that when we ingest a drug, where does it go? Where, what does it do when it, um, when it enters the body? Okay, if I can just go next slide. Now, what type of molecules make good drugs? That's a very simple question you might ask. And, and the simple answer to that is that it's gonna be organic molecules because as you will all know that it, most drugs are organic molecules. But if they're organic molecules, then you might ask what type of atoms that molecule might have, okay? And, and you will learn as we go along that the typical atoms which are present in a drug are carbon, obviously, but also typically a nitrogen and oxygen is also present in, in, in drugs. So a lot of the drugs are what we call heterocyclic molecules. And also the drugs are molecules which, which, um, which are without um, reactive functional groups. That means they don't have any um, functional groups present in them. And also, Many of the drugs, uh, if, you, if you want to find out what, what good drugs are, you could just see in the literature what are the existing drugs at the moment, and you can try to compare your drug with the drugs which are already there. And also another thing which is very important in, in drug discovery or, or, or types of drugs is the type of administration that uh, is required, okay? It can be oral, it can be injection, it can be other routes as well. So we're gonna be looking at that as well. Let me just try to get my um, pointer if I can. It's just uh, arrow pen. I'm trying to get a pen so that you can see where I'm, I'm trying to move my uh, screen. Okay, um, one thing to avoid in drugs, which we, which we don't want in a drug is the reactive functional groups. These are typically avoided in drugs, okay? The reason to avoid these is that many of the biologically or biomolecules where the drug bind to, they may interact or they may react with the reactive functional groups which are present uh, in, in, your, in, your, in your drug molecule. So you want to avoid that. And typically the functional groups to avoid in drugs is alkyl halides aldehydes and ketones and thiols. And there are many other groups which you want to avoid uh, in your drug because they are very reactive molecules. Because the obvious reason is that these groups can form covalent bonds with your biomolecules. They can form covalent bond with the proteins. They can form covalent bond with the DNA. They can form covalent bond with many biomolecules. One of the example which is shown here of a reactive molecule is what we call a mustard gas. The mustard gas was used in, in World War as a, as, a, as a weapon. And if you look at these uh, picture on the left-hand side here, these are actually shells containing the mustard gas. And mustard gas has a highly reactive uh, CH2Cl group attached to a sulfur. So what happens is that can form a three-membered sulfur containing ring. And DNA, for example, if it has an amine group, that amine group will uh, react or ring open that three member ring to form a covalent bond. And, 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 and this poor guy on the right-hand side here is the one 
one of the soldiers who was actually exposed to mustard gas. And you can see what sort of bad side effects it can cause when there's a reactive functional group present in a molecule. So you want to avoid that kind of reactive functional groups in drugs, but there are exceptions to the rules. They are not, all reactive groups are not bad. If you look at the next slide here, this compound here on the left-hand side is a drug that is used to treat cancer, myeloma. And if you look at that molecule here, that molecule also have a similar, um, a similar group, NCH2Cl group, which was present in the mustard gas. It was sulfur, CH2CH2Cl in the mustard gas. Here, this is a nitrogen mustard where the CH2Cl group is attached to nitrogen. And what it does is this drug, it actually reacts with the guanine um, base, which is present in DNA to form a covalent bond. And by forming a covalent bond, it can act as an anti-cancer drug. So the reactive molecules are avoided in drugs, but in some drugs, the reactive molecules can also be, be useful as well. Now let's see another exception, a very well-known drug that is uh, used clinically to treat HIV is called an AZT drug. And if you look at the structure of this AZT drug here is, you will find that it has a reactive group over here. And this reactive group is called as an azide group, okay? And it is tolerated in this antiviral drug. So what happens is in, 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 uh, in HIV, the, the infecting RNA can form a copy of the DNA from the RNA sequence that is present. And this drug here incorporates into the forming DNA chain. And once that drug is incorporated <coughs> in the forming DNA chain, the DNA synthesis cannot continue because of the azide group that is present within the molecule here. So this group, once it gets incorporated into the DNA, the DNA synthesis stops. And that means the virus is killed. So even though it is a reactive group, it can still be accommodated within a, within a drug molecule. So one thing, as I was mentioning to you earlier, the thing to consider is that when you're looking at molecules with properties um, similar to existing drugs, you should also consider what is going to be the route of administration of the drug. And the drug can be given many different ways. It can be taken as a pill. It can be given as an injection. So can we somehow tell that which drug, if we take it orally, is going to be available, is going to be available to treat the disease? And that's where we can calculate properties of molecules and, and are these properties reliable? And we're going to take an example of that later on. And I'm going to give you an exercise to do as well to see if you can calculate, look at a molecule and tell me whether that molecule is going to be a, make, it, make a good drug or not. And also what properties matter for drugs and how can we prioritize them? That's something very important in drug discovery. Okay, so the roots of administration, as I mentioned, that how you're gonna dose your drug, one is simply an injection. You know, we all know about injection because all of us would have had one injection at one time or the other. The drug can simply be inhaled. You can just inhale like a puffer, and I'm gonna show you an example of that. It can be epithelial. That means it can just be applied topically on a skin. That's a possibility. It can be put under the tongue mucous membranes and it oral obviously is the is the way to go because if you want a successful drug everybody prefers a drug that can be taken orally rather than giving as an injection so let's just look at each of these techniques a little bit at a time and then come back to the properties of the drugs which are going to be important in terms of their usefulness and their availability let's talk about Inhalation first. 
I mentioned to you puffers, people who are, suffer from asthma, for example, they, they normally take inhale the drug as a puffer. But also, there's a drug example I'm going to show you, which was developed in Australia. It's called an antiviral drug. It's called Rolenza, and that was discovered and developed in Australia. But let's look at first the advantages of inhalation. If you inhale a drug, it goes directly into our lungs and it avoids the digestive system. So that means the drug is not coming in contact with the acid in the stomach. It's not coming in contact with the enzymes uh, in, your, uh, in your intestine, but it has disadvantages as well. One of the disadvantages of inhaling a drug is that you can't accurately dose how much of the drug is gonna go into the lungs and from the lungs into the bloodstream. Also, the drug may cause lung damage if it's going into the lungs and a portion of it is swallowed as well. Whenever you inhale something, or portion of it that is swallowed as well. And, and Lenza, when it was developed as an antiviral drug in Australia, the way it was delivered was using this puffer shown over here. So the drug was typically crushed uh, in these uh, wheel looking thing. And once it's crushed, then it was inhaled. But the problem with the inhalation was that it was hard to dose it accurately. And also in terms of compliance, when you're inhaling something as a drug, there is always a source of error, okay? And although this drug was very, very active, very, very successful, but the mode of delivery of this drug was its downfall. As soon as a drug called Tamiflu was invented, which could simply be taken as an oral capsule, Relenza basically failed. People started using Tamiflu because that was easy to take as an oral capsule. So that's where the delivery of the drug is very, very important in terms of how you go about it. The other, other way I mentioned the drugs are typically used are epithelial. And by epithelial, we just mean it can be some sort of topical cream or a transdermal patch as shown in this screen. So you can take a drug and just rub it on your skin. And from the skin is it absorbed into the bloodstream. Or you can have some sort of patch where the drug from the patch goes into the uh, bloodstream. And a classical example of a patch is nicotine patch. So many people, who try to quit smoking these days, they have a patch and the patch releases the nicotine uh, into the bloodstream. So again, if you look at the advantages of epithelial drug delivery is that it avoids the digestive system again. So that means again, the drug is not exposed to the acid in the stomach and also the enzymes which are present in the, in the stomach. And there's a steady rate of absorption. So this can be, this can be controlled. And also there's a slow release as well. As we see with the nicotine patches, uh, they can release the nicotine over a period of time. But some of the disadvantages of um, ap drug delivery by epithelial system is that the drug must be able to penetrate the skin. And if a molecule want to absorb through our skin, it must be a lipophilic. Lipophilic means that it should be lipid-like, fat-like molecule so that it can absorb through the skin. Otherwise, it won't be able to absorb through the skin. But the disadvantage can also be that it may cause a skin damage or irritation as well. And some people are allergic to drugs when they are, they are put on the, screen, on the skin. What about the drugs taken sublingual? Sublingual is when you put a drug underneath the tongue. And one of the drugs which is given underneath the tongue is to, is to treat what we call angina. People who have um, constricted blood vessels in the, in, uh, constricted blood vessels uh, in, the, in the heart and, and, and they're getting a, a, a anginal pain, then the nitro, nitro uh, substituted compound is then taken under the tongue so that it can be released very quickly to treat that condition. Even eye drops can be used to, uh, to, to deliver drugs uh, in, in, into the body as well. So the advantages again, that you avoid the digestive system, 
Disadvantage is pretty much same, is hard to control the dose accurately. A portion is swallowed and, and membranes can be easily damaged. And as you know, the membranes under our tongue, they are very, very sensitive. And if the drug is not given properly, it could damage the, the um, membranes. Injections, and, and we'll be all familiar with injections. And, and injections, are obviously many of us would have recently have had COVID injections. And, uh, and, and, and you know, uh, injections can be given in, in, in many different ways. And we're gonna look at that in a second too. But one of the advantages of an injection is that it's a fast response. If you, if you inject it into a vein, vein or, or, a, or it goes into the bloodstream straight away. And also the injection always give an accurate dose. And also a lower dose is required compared to say, for example, taking the drug orally. And it's also the best route for drugs or compounds which are, which are unstable, like peptides and proteins can be unstable if you take them orally. Big molecules which can't absorb through the membranes, they also can be given by injection. And also giving by injection, you're avoiding the digestive system. But the disadvantages of giving an injection is that the drug must be sterile or the liquid in which you have the drug must be sterile. Otherwise, if there are bacteria present in it, you will get a bacterial infection. And also it is easy to overdose when you are injecting a drug because um, it is going directly into the bloodstream. And also if there are side effects, when a drug is injected, they're harder to control because it's in the blood already. And then it can be painful. You know, some people um, don't like injections and, and also the poor patient compliance. Even personally myself, if I had to take a drug, I will rather take a capsule or a tablet rather than taking an, an injection, but sometime it can't be avoided. This is just a slide to give you a little bit of information about different types of injections which are there. Because at the moment, most of you would have use some sort of intramolecular, uh, sorry, intramuscular injection where the injection is given into the muscle like in the arm or the buttocks or the thigh. Intravenous injection is where the injection is given into the vein directly. A bit like, bit like when, people, when they're collecting blood from a person, they, they look for the vein and then put the needle in there. S similar thing that you're putting the injection directly into the vein. Subcutaneous is under the surface of the skin. If you lift the skin and then put the injection, then it's a subcutaneous. Intrathecal, uh, that is when the injection is given into spinal cords. And that's quite common when women are, women are in labor and giving uh, birth to babies because that's where the injection is injected into the spinal cord. Interperitoneal is when the injection is given to the body cavity. And that's very common with cancer patients. And when we are doing cancer trials on mice and rats, we try to give the interperitoneal injection. An implant can be some sort of osmotic pump, which can be attached, which then uh, deliver the drug as required. Okay. What about oral administration? So I've been telling everybody that oral administration uh, is, the, is the preferred route as far as drugs are concerned. And we're gonna find out in a minute what properties are important in terms of having a drug which becomes bioavailable when it's taken orally. So the example of oral administration is pills and tablets and capsules and syrups and suspension. We all know about that. We all have had one of these at one stage or the other. Good patient compliance. Everybody likes to take a pill. That's the easiest way to give a drug. And it's well understood because we all know it and we all take it, so it's easy. But the disadvantages many of you won't know of oral administration is that the drug must be readily absorbed through the intestine because the drug ultimately goes to the intestine. And if it's not absorbed through the intestine, then the drug is just kicked out, drug is uh, excreted out and there is no beneficial effect. There could be delayed effect because the drug has to reach first the, past the stomach, get into the intestine, and then get absorbed. So it can be delayed effect. 
and also must be able to survive the stomach because of the stomach has acid and many compounds many drugs are sensitive to acid so if they are decomposed in the stomach they won't get uh, absorbed and you don't get any any effect and also sometimes you can get a food and drug interaction some types of food may interfere with the drug and you might get side effects or no effect of the drug uh, and the patient must be able to cooperate that you know it's not a problem with younger people but it can be a problem with the older population that some of them they don't like to take even tablets okay so what happens when the drug is ingested so we take a capsule put it in our mouth what happens to it very little happens in the mouth and throat so when the drug is taken very little is absorbed in the mouth and there's nothing broken down when we swallow the pill it just goes through our mouth through our throat into the stomach now in the stomach we have hcl we have acid and also we have gastric enzymes present as well however in the stomach very little of the drug is absorbed as well it can decompose if the compound is sensitive to acid if the sensitive to gastric enzymes and the ph of the stomach is 1 to 2 so it's quite acidic so your drug has to be stable to the acidic ph so the intestine is the one where there's main opportunity for the absorption of the drug and there are digestive enzymes present and if your compound is sensitive if your drug is sensitive to the digestive enzymes the chances are it'll get broken down and the ph of the intestine is between 7 to 9 so a bit more towards the alkaline side while the ph of the blood is pretty much neutral and this is just a graphical picture of the intestine what is more important for chemistry or biochemistry perspective is that what is this membrane of the intestine or the membranes are made up of and you can see this long whitish or grayish looking chains going down like that and then you can see these greens and red balls on the top and this is what we call a lipid bilayer membranes are made up of lipid bilayer and that's more clearer on the next slide what a lipid bilayer means and what does it look like this is an example of a very simple example of a lipid bilayer the membranes are composed of what we call phospholipids and this is a structure here of a phospholipid and the phospholipids are typically made up of a central unit we call glycerol this three carbon chain alcohol is called as a glycerol and the glycerol is now esterified at the two of the positions with long chain fatty acids shown by stearic acid and palmitic acid and on the third one there's a there's a phosphate group and then there is a side chain attached to it and then this particular case this side chain is choline and this is an example of what we call phospholipid and the phospholipid this fatty acid section of the molecule here is what we call hydrophobic region or the greasy organic environment because this is like an alkyl chain like a fat chain and is a hydrophobic and it is lipophilic that means is fatty it hates water but it likes it likes to be in the in the fatty in the, in the lipid environment on the other hand this group here which is a charged group it is what we call a hydrophilic group it loves water it hates the greasy part and and that's where it likes to be in the aqueous environment because it's polar so the membranes the phospholipids then the the charge portion of the molecule is towards the aqueous part and the fatty layer is towards the inside making this lipid bilayer membranes so the membranes which we have in our intestine they are made up of these greasy chains these hydrophilic molecules hydrophilic components which are there within the molecule so the drug has to absorb through this membrane to get into the blood stream so that's the important thing that means the drug must have some polarity some charge 
And also it must have some greasiness to be able to go through the, through the membrane. And we're gonna be looking at that a bit more uh, in a bit more detail and then see uh, what happens. So this greasiness is very important. Most drugs will enter the bloodstream through passive absorption. Passive absorption means the drug is just gonna go into the intestine and then without any energy, it's just gonna absorb through that membrane into the bloodstream. So that means the molecule, the drug molecule must have enough charge and also polarity and to enter the aqueous environment because the intestine, when you're absorbing the drug, when you're taking the pill, there's an aqueous environment, okay? So there must be some sort of charge polar group associated with the molecule so that it can enter the aqueous environment. And they must also have greasy character to pass through the lipid bilayer because lipid bilayer we just saw is made up of those fatty chains. So that means the molecule should be able to get through that greasy lipid bilayer to get into, into the into the bloodstream. And this greasiness is a measurable property. You can actually measure the greasiness of a molecule. And that is represented by a term called log P. And we'll see what log P is in a minute and how can we measure or calculate the log P of a molecule. And can we set some rules which will allow us to predict whether a molecule is gonna pass through the membrane or not. So it's a property that can be calculated uh, uh, for theoretical molecules. You can just draw a structure and then you can calculate the log P value or the greasiness of a molecule. And how that, that is done experimentally. You can experimentally calculate the log P or the greasiness of a molecule by measuring what we call a partition coefficient of a drug. The partition coefficient can be measured very easily. It can be done by measuring how the compound is distributed between octanol. Octanol is representing the greasy layer and water is the polar layer. So if you take a separated funnel and you put octanol and water in it, you will find that they will form two layers. Octanol and water wouldn't mix they will just form two layers. So if you take a drug molecule and put into the separating funnel and then just shake it, and after it comes to an equilibrium, you measure the concentration of the compound or the drug that is present in the octanol layer. And then you measure the concentration of the compound that is present in the water layer because the drug will distribute itself in the water layer and octanol layer, depending upon the chemical structure of the drug. Simply, if the compound is more soluble in water, if the compound is more soluble in water, that means the term at the bottom here is, is bigger, then this partition coefficient is gonna be less than one because this term here is bigger than the term at the top. So that means P will be less than one. If P is less than one and you take a log of that, you're gonna get a negative value because log P will be negative in this case. On the other hand, if the compound is more soluble in octanol, is more greasy, this concentration is higher than the concentration at the bottom, then P is gonna be greater than one. That means the partition coefficient is gonna be greater than one. And if partition coefficient is greater than one, then the log P is gonna be positive. So you can simply measure the log P value of a compound by simply equilibrating it in an octanol and water layer and measuring how much compound is present in octanol and how much is present in water. So that's a very useful property. And also in the literature, log P has been measured for thousands of compounds. You have a library of log P molecules where they have been experimentally determined. And also the contribution of many substituents and functional groups to the hydrophobicity can be approximated. You can theoretically assign a value to a particular functional group present in a molecule. And I'm gonna show you an example on the next slide where we're gonna take a chlorobenzene and we're gonna have 
the log p value of benzene, and then a pi value for chloro. And then we just add it into that and we get a, a calculated value for that molecule. And C log p value can be calculated for theoretical molecules by adding or subtracting these approximated values from the log p of the known compounds. So you can even draw an unknown structure and then you can calculate this log p value by simply taking the value which is known in the literature already for a similar compound and then adding and subtracting groups and that will give you the value. So even chem draw these days, if you have chem draw, you can draw the structure of a molecule and chem draw can calculate the log p value of that compound. And just show you one example. Uh, so the, the, the log p value we're trying to find out is for a molecule called chlorobenzene. And chlorobenzene simply have this structure where it got a benzene ring and then there's a chloro group attached to it, basically. So that's the structure. And, and if you want to calculate theoretically the value of this chlorobenzene, uh, the log p value, you just look at the log p value of benzene, which is 2.13. And the pi value for this chloro functional group is 0 0.71. And all you need to do is just add the log p of benzene and plus add that pi value, which is 2.13 plus 0 0.17, and you get a value of 2.84. So you can simply calculate that the C log p value of chlorobenzene is gonna be 2.84. And, and if you actually measured it experimentally, the chlorobenzene value log p, you will get exactly the same answer. So that means you don't need to actually measure the log p values yourself you can simply calculate it. And there are many methods available and software available for calculating the log p values. And this log p value is a very useful term if you are looking at a drug and wanting to find out whether the drug will be bioavailable or not. Okay, let's go to the next slide. And this study was done by a, a very famous a group of medicinal chemists and, and they were working for Pfizer. And, and, and what Pfizer scientists they did were, they looked at what are the trends in the calculated pro calculable properties of all commercially available drugs. So what they do was they, they looked at structures of all the commercially available mm -hmm. drugs that were available at that time orally administered and passively absorbed. So they, they looked at the structure of many, many different drugs, which were commercially available. They were orally administered, given as a tablet or a capsule, and they're passively absorbed. And they came up with the following observations. That's what they found. They found that the drugs which are taken orally and readily absorbed, they have a molecular weight less than 500. That was one property. And also they don't have no more than five hydrogen bond donors. And I'm gonna show you some example, what do we mean by hydrogen bond donors? So for example, if you have an NH group, this is like a hydrogen bond donor, okay? Or you have an OH group, this is like a hydrogen bond donor because this hydrogen can be donated, right? In a hydrogen bond. And they had no more than 10 hydrogen bond acceptors. Acceptors are groups, for example, oxygen is an acceptor group because oxygen has lone pair of electrons and it can accept. It can accept a hydrogen in terms of forming a hydrogen bond, right? So the drugs had no more than 10 hydrogen bond receptors. And also the C log P values of all those drugs were less than five. And I just told you how to calculate the C log P value. And they found that these properties were most common in the drugs that were taken orally and easily absorbed. Okay, and they call this Lipinski's rule of five, because their molecular weight is less than 500, no more than five hydrogen bonds, C log P less than five, 
and it's called Lipinski's rule of five. And remember that there are no five rules, there are only four rules, but it's called as uh, Lipinski's rule of five, okay? And medicinal chemists all around the world have been using this Lipinski's rule to depend, to design new drugs, which they think will be bioavailable. So this is still used these days uh, in terms of the rules uh, in designing drugs, okay? And Lipinski's rules are not only one, it has become more sophisticated now. And, and there are many predictive tools which are available, which can tell you whether a drug is gonna be uh, orally bioavailable. That means you take it and then it goes in. Uh, and, um, and other additions now to the Lipinski's rule of five, um, uh, Iram has a question, but when, when I finish in few slides, Iram, we can have a question then, okay? Um, so C log P can vary from minus five, minus 0 0.5 to 5.6. Molecular weight can be 160 to 500. Other rules which have been added is that the number of atoms can be between 20 to 70. Molar refractivity, uh, which matches the polarizability of a compound can be 40 to 30. Polar surface area is used as well, and it should be less than 140 uh, a, a square. And, and in addition to the Lipinski's rule, there is, there is a, a prediction egg available, which is a multi-dimensional analysis of calculated properties, which is used to predict oral absorption, brain penetration, metabolism, and much more. So there are many software, many properties which are available, uh, which you can measure and then predict whether this compound is gonna be absorbable or not when you take it as a pill. Okay, I'm just gonna show you the example of this egg. What do we mean by this egg? And that is shown here uh, on this slide. So this is a plot of A log C value here. Yeah, and also PSA2D, and I just told you what PSA2D is. PSA2D is polar surface area. So polar surface area uh, versus uh, you got A log P plot. And, and if you plot that for many different drugs, you will get an, an egg-shaped curve. And, and what we say is if your ratio of this A log P and PSA2D lies inside this green region, lies in this inside this egg shown by these green crosses, then you have a good um, compound. And if it lies outside in the blue region here, we call it a moderate. And it's obviously if it lies outside this egg here, it becomes poor, very poor and so on. So these predicted properties can be used to give you an idea uh, of whether the drug absorbed will be bioavailable or not. Um, Iram, you have a question. I just, okay, I'll, that's, uh, let's have a question first. These are the examples I'm gonna try to solve it with you and, uh, and asking you to predict the bioavailability of, of the compounds. Sorry, you want to say your question now? or we can have the question after we're done with these slides. Anyway, this is like a little workshop for you guys to do. We got four structures here. One is called MC1. Sorry, I just go back. Oops, 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 something happened. I just share screen again. I somehow lost. Um, just one second, I will open that again. All right, just one second. All right, sorry about that. It's somehow my screen just quit it. Let me just share it again. Um, share screen. Okay, and I'll just take you back to where we were just now and we were here. All right, okay. So we got four structures over here, uh, MC1. MC2, MC3, MC4, and we are trying to predict the bioavailability of these compounds. And we're gonna try the Lipinski's rules 
on these compounds and then try to predict what are the values we're looking for and also would those values give us the answer uh, in terms of predicting the bioavailability of these compounds. So what you typically, what we ask the students to do is to go ahead and calculate the C log P values of these compounds, calculate the molecular weight of the compound, calculate how many hydrogen, don hydrogen bond donors are there and calculate how much from hydrogen bond acceptors are there. And I have done that for you already and you may want to check it yourself. So if I just go to the next slide, I actually have given you all that data in that table over here. So the four compounds, I've given the molecular weight. These are the four molecular weights here. And you can see they're all below 500. And also I have calculated the hydrogen bond uh, donor sites for you. That means how many groups are there in the molecule which can donate a, a hydrogen bond. And also there are hydrogen bond acceptor sites within the molecule. And also I've calculated the C log P values of the four compounds which we have. And also there is a, a polar surface area for these compounds is calculated as well. Okay, so you can also, even you're looking at hydrogen bond donor and hydrogen bond acceptor, you can actually look at the structure and tell yourself so looking at this structure here, the first one, you can actually work out just by looking at the structure here to see how many hydrogen bond donors it has. And you can see here, there's only one NH group here where the hydrogen can give that, as a, NH can act as a donor to form a hydrogen bond, right? So there should be value of one for that compound. And if you look at the MC1 here, the MC1 has a value of one in terms of hydrogen bond donor sites. And if you look at the hydrogen bond acceptor sites, um, how many uh, atoms are there which can accept? So there's a oxygen here which can accept a hydrogen because oxygen has lone pair of electrons. And similarly, NH also has a lone pair of electrons as well. So this can also act as an acceptor. So there are two acceptor sites which are present uh, in this molecule. And, and um, that is what we have uh, calculated here. There are two acceptor sites and one donor site. And, and you, can, you can look at the other structure yourself in your own time and try to work out how many hydrogen bond donor sites are there and hydrogen bond acceptor sites are there. And also you can calculate these log P values if you have access to ChemDraw, you can do, use it ChemDraw to calculate the log P values, or you can go to this web page here and try to calculate the log P values. I must tell you that the log P values can vary from one software to the other, but the trend will be very similar. So, so don't get worried that if you're getting a different value of C log P when you calculate it yourself. And similarly, the polar surface area can give you slightly different values. But what I want you to do is, is to answer these questions which are there from the data that is provided. So the first question I have for you is that which of these compounds is predicted to be more soluble in water than ethanol? And then you need to explain your answer. Okay, so you need to look at the compound and you look at the data I have provided to you you need to answer which compound or compounds are predicted to be more soluble in water than octanol. And that's where you need to look at the log P value because I showed you earlier that when you're measuring the ratio of the concentration between octanol and water, you can tell which one is more soluble in water, which one is more soluble in octanol by measuring the concentration, which is directly related to the log P. The next question is which compound or compounds violate the Lipinski's rule of five and which rule is violated? Okay, we told you that there's a rule of five. There was molecular weight. There was how many hydrogen bond donor sites, how many hydrogen bond acceptor sites. <clears throat> you need to check. The next thing that you, you need to do is to, is to predict the intestinal absorption for each compound based on the East, East Egan's egg. So that means you need to calculate the 
log p was given to you on left hand side and also uh, there was the psi on the x axis so you can put those values into that graph which i have and that will tell you whether the compound is good moderate very poor or poor so you can do that as well and also which compound or compound would you expect to be orally bioavailable based on these prediction tools and are there any features or functional groups that might be problematic i told you in the beginning that some functional groups which are reactive functional groups they are not good for drugs because those groups can react with the biomolecules and hence cause problems so this is an exercise for you you can do it on your own time you don't have to do it right now because otherwise you'll be uh, stressing out <laughs> we don't want to uh, don't want to rush and try to do it now but try to do that yourself and and and, uh, and, and you can talk to vidya um, maybe if you are not sure about your answers or you want to check your answers with with vidya i can i can give a, a representative answers to vidya if you like okay so this is an exercise for you to do in your own time um, and i think it's time for now for me to move on to the related topic which is what are the biological targets of drugs when we take the drug so we learn we take the drug the drug can be taken orally injection whatever and the drug has to reach the blood stream right if it taken orally it goes through the intestine absorbed into the into the blood stream so what happens next you might ask where that drug is going to go and bind and show its effect and there are many different biological targets which are there for drugs and obviously we not going to have time to look at every single one of them but i'm just going to show you some representative targets where the drugs can go and bind and also tell you some of the properties which the biological targets might have and selectivity is very important because if you take a drug and it binds everywhere then you're going to have a lot of problems because you won't have any selectivity it might cure say for example if we take a pill for the headache it might cure the headache but it also might cause something else which we don't want <laughs> so we need to have a selective drug selectivity is very very important now let's look at biological targets what kind of biological targets are over there but before we do that um drug targets one thing to remember is they're going to be larger molecules and these are what we call biomolecules or macromolecules and these biomolecules can be proteins which are large can be enzymes which are large can be even the whole membrane can be even the dna so they are all big molecules the targets and and as a rule of thumb drugs are typically much smaller than their target so that i mean if you look at aspirin for example it's a small molecule while the targets are big and obviously the drugs are going to interact with their target by binding to them and they're going to bind at the binding sites and each target for example an enzyme is going to have a certain place certain binding site where the drug can bind it can't just simply bind everywhere and the binding sites are typically hydrophobic hollows or clefts so there are there are these are these are clear um positions within the biological molecule where the drug can bind and i'm going to show you some examples of that to show you what these hollows and clefts look like where the small molecule is going to bind and that's where the specificity or selectivity comes from and also we're going to learn that when a drug binds to the biomolecule it involves some sort of intermolecular bond it's going to form some sort of bond and that bond can be a covalent bond between the drug and the biomolecule and more typically it could simply be a a a a, a, a non covalent bond and we'll see the examples of that in a second the other thing you need to know is that most drugs when they bind to a biomolecule or target they are on they are in equilibrium with, between being bound and unbound to the target so there's some sort of equilibrium that is present between the free drug and the drug bound to the target 
And the functional groups that are present in the drugs are typically involved in binding interactions. And these groups are called binding groups. So the drugs are gonna have this nitrogen containing group or a oxygen containing group or a sulfur containing group, which is gonna bind to the, which is gonna help the drug bind to the target. And specific regions within the binding sites that are involved in binding interactions are called as binding regions. So the drug, the groups in the drugs are called as binding groups, while the regions which are present within the biomolecule, in the biomolecules, the proteins and the enzymes is called binding regions. That's where the molecule binds. Okay, now what are examples of biological targets which are there? The examples of biological targets can be lipids. That means particularly cell membrane lipids because we learned the membranes are made up of phospholipids. So that means the drugs can interact with those lipids which are present in the cell membranes. But more commonly, the drugs will bind to some sort of proteins. And the examples are enzymes. That's the most common one because in biological system, in our body, there are many, many different enzymes present doing different, uh, different functions. So if we can interfere the function of with one of the enzymes, it's gonna have a, some sort of a biological effect. Also structural proteins are very important as well because when the cells are dividing, uh, these structural proteins are, are very important forming cytoskeleton and the cells are dividing. Uh, and, and if you can interfere with that cell division, obviously that's gonna be a problem. There is receptors as well. Our body has many different receptors. And if we got time, we're gonna to touch on that as well to see how drugs can interact with receptors. And also we're gonna look at DNA as a target as well for binding drugs. There are many other targets based on carbohydrates and I'm not gonna go there. I'm just gonna to try to cover as much as I can, as much time allows within that. Um, and we're gonna cover some of these. Okay, so let's start with the membranes, the drugs which interact with the membranes. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this slide because we already talked about what a cell membrane looks like. And, and we already talked about phospholipid and bilayer. We know that membranes are made up of phospho phospholipid bilayers. They have a hydrophobic tail, which we talked about earlier. And they have, um, uh, polar groups, which are uh, shown at the top there. And these long chains, they interact with each other by these hydrophobic interactions. We call them van der Waal interactions. And they're hidden from the aqueous environment. And the polar group, they interact with the, with the, with the water um, on the outside. So that's the typical uh, phospholipid bilayer. And, and we talked about that already, that the cell membranes provide Oops, sorry, that the cell membranes, they provide um, a hydrophobic barrier around the cell, preventing the passage of water and polar molecules. Um, that's the standard cell membrane. And also there are many proteins which are embedded into the cell membranes, which are ion channels, receptors, enzymes, transport proteins, and so on. It's a complicated structure, right? But the basic components, the basic building block of a cell membrane is just phospholipid bilayer. And if you look at the cell itself, uh, in that sense, this is the cell, which is shown here. And obviously there's a nucleus, nucleus and cytoplasm and all the other things present in the cell. What we are mainly concerned about at the moment is this tiny bit uh, phospholipid cell membrane. That's what we are talking about at the moment. And cell membrane just shown in a different way again, the hydrophobic tails and the polar groups at the top. So just a different representation of the cell membrane. So how can drugs interact with the cell membrane? And the drug in, in, as, a, as an example I got here is called gramicidine. Gramicidine is a, is a peptide. Peptide means various amino acids are linked together. And these are like valine, glycine, alanine, leucine, and so on. And Gramicidine antibiotic, it actually interacts with bacterial membranes. 
This is an example of, a, again, a phospholipid bilayer. And this gramocidine can insert itself into the cell membrane. And if it inserts into the cell membrane, so these helical structure you see here, uh, they are the gramocidine. And once gramocidine inserts into the bacterial membrane, or into, the, into the membrane, it forms what we call an escape tunnel. And if it forms an escape tunnel, then all the ions with the, inside the cell, they will ooze out. And if the ions from the inside, which are hydrophilic, there's uncontrolled passage of the ion, the cell is gonna die. So that's how it is able to um, show its antibacterial activity. Antibiotic is something which kills bacteria and gramocidin basically interacts with the lipid membranes. That means it interacts with these hydrophobic tails, the lipid greasy tails, which are present uh, in the lipid membranes and basically causes a pore formation so that the ions from inside the cell is lost uncontrollably. And if ions are lost, then the cell dies. So that's how it shows its effect. So that's an example of a biomolecule, the phospholipid bilayer, which is uh, acting as a, as a target. But by far, the most common target of drugs is enzymes. And, and you will all know that enzymes are body's catalysts. They are body's machines. They make uh, body function. And, and enzymes are basically made up of proteins. They are just proteins. And their main function is to act as catalysts. They catalyze reactions. And the way enzymes catalyze reaction is by lowering the activation energy of a reaction. So if you look at this reaction here, the reactants are shown here and the product is shown here. And if there is no enzyme present, these reactants, they have to go through a transition state here to be able to go to the product. And we call that activation energy. There's an activation energy required that is to go from a reactant to this transition state and then to the product, right? But if an enzyme is present, enzyme lowers this activation energy that is required. So if you compare this energy with this energy here, without the enzyme, you can see that much more energy is required. And when enzymes are present, um, you can have these reactions happening uh, in an in a, in a easy manner. So the way the enzymes help the reaction is then the enzymes that provided, they provide a reaction surface. So there's a reactant A and there is a reactant B. These are your starting substrates and the enzyme provides a space where both of these can go into the enzyme. And if they're close by, an enzyme brings these reactants together, orient them correctly, and weaken the reactant bonds and a product is formed. So that means lowers the activation energy and the reaction happens much more easily than it otherwise would, right? That's what enzymes do, that's their function. Just some criteria about binding interactions must be strong enough to hold the substrate sufficiently long enough for the reaction to occur because it has to be there for a certain time before the reaction can take place. And the interaction between the substrate or the reactant and the enzyme should be weak so that the product can depart. And it implies a fine balance. There's a fine balance in the enzyme reaction between the reactants and the product. And if you design a molecule with a stronger binding interaction, uh, it will result in enzyme inhibition, which will block the active site. So what do we mean by that? If I just go back, what we call this part here, where the reactants are binding, is this part of the cleft or the cavity here is called as an active site. So the reactants go in, bind there, and the reaction takes place and the product formed. But if you take a drug, which actually has stronger binding to this receptor site, then this is gonna bind preferentially to the substrate. And if that happens, then the substrate or the starting compounds won't be able to bind the enzyme and you'll get an inhibition of the enzymes. 
And that's how the drugs act. They can act as inhibitors of enzymes. We'll see that more in a minute. Now let's look at how enzymes can act as drug targets. What do drugs do in this case? So just a little bit of a text to go with it. Drugs can do both things. They can activate or inhibit the enzymes, but inhibitors are most common. Okay, so the enzyme is doing a function and you inhibit that function by using a drug. Inhibitors interfere with substrate binding. That means the starting substrate cannot bind into the active site we talked about. And if substrate doesn't bind, it cannot undergo the enzyme catalyzed reaction because if the reactants cannot bind to the enzyme, there can be no reaction. Oops, oops, oops. And sorry, I have to take you forward because, okay. All right. So if the substrate doesn't wind, it cannot undergo enzyme catalyzed reaction. And the interesting thing is that the enzyme inhibitors can be used against human enzymes. They can also be used against pathogen enzymes, virus or bacteria, depending upon the disease, disease condition. So if you want to say, for example, kill a virus in the body, you then have an inhibitor, which is inhibiting the enzyme, which is required by the virus. On the other hand, for other diseases, human diseases, you might need to inhibit the human enzyme rather than the pathogen enzyme, okay? And inhibitors can be reversible or irreversible. We'll see that in a minute. What do we mean by a reversible inhibitor and an irreversible inhibitor? And the inhibitors can be competitive and non-competitive as well. And we'll see that what we mean by competitive and non-competitive as well. And by looking at examples of drugs uh, targeting enzymes. So let's just look at one now. We're gonna start with an irreversible inhibitor of an enzyme. By irreversible inhibitor, as the name in, implies, that something is gonna bind the enzyme active site and never leave because it's an irreversible inhibitor. And it can be irreversible inhibitor by forming a covalent bond. So this is the active site of the enzyme in the cleft over here. And this is the drug which is coming in. And the drug is gonna bind in that active site by a covalent bond between this carbon here and this oxygen here. So it's forming a covalent bond. So this is an example of an enzyme which is a, sorry, an inhibitor, which is an irreversible inhibitor. It comes in, binds, and stays there. And often a covalent bond is formed because covalent bond is the one which is not reversible. And substrate is blocked from the active site. So that means if, an, if the substrate wants to come in now, it won't be able to come in because it's already blocked. And even if you increase the concentration of your substrate by as much amount as you like, it still cannot displace the inhibitor because it's bound in there. So it doesn't cause reversible inhibition. An inhibitor is likely to be similar in structure to the substrate. So in order to be able to bind to the active site of the enzyme, the inhibitor need to have a similar structure to your, to your starting reagent or starting substrate. Otherwise the enzyme wouldn't recognize it. And also this, this kind of inhibition is good for a non-human inhibition or a pathogen inhibition. If you want to kill a virus or want to kill a bacteria, you want this kind of inhibition so that you destroy the bacterial enzyme by irreversible inhibition. If the bacterial enzyme is destroyed, bacteria is dead. They're not affecting the humans, only the bacteria. So let's look at a real example of this now. A real example of this is the drugs which everybody would have taken at one stage or the other is penicillins. When we get a chest infection, when we get a throat infection, when we get a, uh, any kind of infection, penicillin is a very commonly described antibiotic. It's called ampicillin, it's called amoxil, there are many different names for it. So what does this antibiotic does? This antibiotics inhibits this enzyme called transpeptidase. 
And transpeptidase enzyme is the one which is involved in building bacterial cell wall. So the good thing, good thing um, is that the bacterial cells are different from human cells. Bacterial cells have a cell wall and we don't have a cell wall. That's a good thing. So if you can inhibit the bacterial cell wall, you will kill bacteria, not killing the human cells. So bacteria have cell wall and they use this enzyme to make this cell wall. And that is made by cross-linking what we call peptidoglycans. Peptidoglycans mean there is a peptide and glycan means sugar. There's a sugar and peptide chains. These chains are called peptidoglycan. And I'll show you an example of a minute. And penicillin and all the other antibiotics, cyclosferin, which is based on penicillin, they irreversibly bind to the active site of this bacterial enzyme. And it's bactericidal. Bactericidal means it kills bacteria. It's cidal. Cidal means kills. And it causes bacterial death. And that's an example of this transpeptidase enzyme. Let's show you what it means. What does this transpeptidase does? As I told you that this transpeptidase helps in building cell wall. So this is an example of a peptidoglycan. The green part here is showing the sugar part or the carbohydrate part. And this part here is the peptide part. That's why we call it a peptidoglycan. And pe peptides are just made up of amino acids, okay? So when two chains of these peptidoglycans come together, this transpeptidase enzyme helps to link this glycine amino acid chain with the D-alanine amino acid that is present in the next chain. So these two are linked together and one of the D-alanine is kicked out and a covalent bond is formed between glycine and alanine. And that's how you get a cross-linking. And when the cross-linking happens, that's where the cell wall starts to form. And if you can inhibit this enzyme here, you're not gonna be able to get a good cell wall because there is no cross-linking. If the cell wall doesn't cross-link, if the peptidoglycan layers don't cross-link, the cell wall is very weak and very easily destroyed and the bacteria are dead. So penicillin, what it does is it inhibits this transpeptidase enzyme. It kills this peptidase enzyme because it forms a covalent bond. And that is shown in a cartoon representation here that this is the active site of this transpeptidase enzyme. So imagine that this box here is the transpeptidase enzyme. And within the transpeptidase enzyme, there is active site in the enzyme. And one of the peptide chain, the, the, the peptidoglycan chain will come into this active site. And this serine amino acid, which is present in the, in the enzyme, it binds to this alanine. So it forms a bond with the alanine. And when the second peptide chain comes into this same active site, this alanine connects with the glycine and the enzyme is recovered. That's what the job of a catalyst is. Catalyst does the reaction and then is recovered at the end of it. Catalyst is not consumed in the reaction. So transpeptidase enzyme does this cross-linking and the enzyme is ready to accept another chain to come in, cross-link, out you go another chain comes in. That's how the cell wall is formed. Now what happens when there is penicillin present? So penicillin comes and binds to the same active site where the peptidoglycan comes to form cell wall. So if penicillin, this is the structure of penicillin by the way, and penicillin is an example of a beta-lactam antibiotic. And this four-membered ring with the nitrogen here is a beta-lactam ring, okay? It's got a CO-N bond and, and a cyclic structure. It's called a lactam. And it's a beta-lactam. It's a four-membered ring. And this serine amino acid, which typically reacts with this peptidoglycan layer, it reacts with that four-membered ring and forms a covalent bond with penicillin. And once a covalent bond is formed with the penicillin, the active site is occupied. The active site is irreversibly occupied. And when the peptide chain comes in, 
it cannot come in, it's blocked because there's a drug present in it, which has covalently bound it. And if the peptidoglycan cannot form a cross-linking, then the bacteria basically die and, 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 and you get this antibiotic effect. So remember, next time you take penicillin for a chest infection or any other infection, that this is what is happening in the body, is, is killing that enzyme transpeptidase in bacteria without affecting any of the enzymes which are present in our body because transpeptidase is only present in, in bacteria and bacteria have cell wall and we don't have cell wall. That's how the penicillin acts. That's not the only drug. There's another drug called, uh, I wouldn't go into the details of that. This is called Olistat. And this is an anti-obesity drug. Anti-obesity drug is that the drug which can uh, cause weight loss. Uh, all of us <laughs> are very, uh, very concerned about our weight these days. <laughs> so this drug here is called as an anti-obesity drug. It basically uh, interferes or, or stops the functioning of pancreatic lipase. So in, in our pancreas, we have an enzyme called lipase and the lipase breaks down the fat we eat and then the fat is absorbed in the body. After breaking down, the fat is absorbed in the body. But if you destroy the enzyme, which is hydrolyzing the fat or breaking the fat, then the fat is not absorbed in the body, it just gets treated. So that's how this anti-obesity drug works. So this is our pancreatic lipase. It also have that OH group from the serine amino acid. And this drug also have a four member ring. In this case, the ring is a lactone. It's not a lactam, it's a lactone. But the mechanism is very similar. The OH group reacts with this lactone to form a covalent bond. And if the drug binds a covalent bond, it just stays there. And then the pancreatic lipase is unable to, to break down the fat we consume and the fat is excreted and we don't get the calories from it and we don't put on weight. So that means all the fatty acids and the glycerol are less absorbed as a result. And that means we have reduced biosynthesis of fat in the body. So that's an anti-obesity drug, but acts in a very similar way as penicillin, but this acts on our enzyme, not bacterial enzyme, right? So this is the difference. Okay, let's look at a little bit now about what is reversible inhibition and what is irreversible inhibition. So what we saw just now was examples of irreversible inhibition, where the penicillin went to the acticide, bound it, and stayed there. The reversible inhibition can be three kinds. One is called competitive inhibition. That's a very common in drug action. And we're gonna look at examples of the competitive inhibition. There can be also non-competitive inhibition. So competitive inhibition is where the substrate and the inhibitor, they bind at the same site. So they're competing with each other to bind to the active site. And the active site is represented by this little hollow in that egg. Non-competitive inhibition is where the substrate and the inhibitor, they have their own little binding pockets. So the substrate has a binding pocket, inhibitor has a binding pocket. But what happens is when the inhibitor binds the binding pocket, it changes the structure of this cavity, which is there. And the structure of this cavity is changed, then the substrate is not able to bind it properly, but they have different sites. It's also called as an allosteric uh, inhibition as well. Uncompetitive, we're not gonna cover that. Uncompetitive is only when the substrate binds to the site, only then the inhibitor can bind. So there's no competition between the substrate and the inhibitor in this case. So now let's look at one example of a, of a uh, inhibitor, which is a reversible uh, inhibitor. But just a bit of, uh, information about uh, inhibitor, sorry, uh, about a reversible inhibitor. So inhibitor binds reversibly to the active site. That means it just goes there. There's intermolecular interaction involved, but there's no covalent bond, only intermolecular uh, bonds like hydrogen bonding, hydrophobic effects, acid-base effect, 
no covalent bond. The inhibitor undergoes no chemical reaction. Inhibition depends upon the strength of the inhibitor binding and inhibitor concentration. If inhibitor can bind to the binding site more strongly, then obviously substrate won't be able to bind. And inhibitor is present in large concentration, then the substrate also can't get in. And the substrate is blocked from the active site. Um, but, but the good thing about reversible inhibition is that if you increase the substrate concentration, you can reverse the inhibition. That means you can kick out the inhibitor from the active site if you got large amount of your substrate concentration. And also inhibitor is likely to be similar in structure to substrate because it has to bind into the same pocket, so it has to be a, a similar structure. Okay, let's look at a real example of a drug now. And the drug we are looking at in the case of a competitive reversible inhibition is called statins. I don't know if you have heard about this drug called statins. Statins are very commonly prescribed drugs. These drugs, they lower the cholesterol in the blood, lower the amount of cholesterol that is present in the blood. And cholesterol, increased cholesterol concentration in blood is typically associated with heart disease. And, and blocking of arteries, heart disease is a very common disease these days, particularly so in the Western world, but also in the developed and developing countries as well. So the role of this enzyme, the role of, sorry, this drug is to reduce cholesterol. And cholesterol biosynthesis in the body is a complicated process. It, there is about 20 steps involved in biosynthesis of cholesterol in the body. But one of the rate limiting step, step, the key step in the biosynthesis of cholesterol is the conversion of this molecule, HMGACOA, to mevalonic acid. And the structures are presented here. This is mevalonic acid, and this is the structure of the um, HMG or hydroxymethylglutaryl COA. And the enzyme that is involved in this key step is called as HMG COA reductase. That's the key enzyme which converts this molecule into mevalonic acid. And cholesterol is a major component of atherosclerotic plaque. That's the plaque which blocks the arteries in heart patients. And the increased, hyper means increased, increased cholesterol level in the blood is a primary risk factor for heart disease. So whenever people go for a health check, they normally look at how much cholesterol is present in the body. And if the cholesterol is high, the doctor will say, watch out, <laughs> you should reduce all the greasy food you're eating. And in many cases, they will prescribe these statins and the statin will reduce the cholesterol level. And the way statin reduces the cholesterol level is that is an inhibitor of this enzyme. It stops this reaction from happening. And if that reaction step is inhibited, then it lowers the cholesterol production and it lowers the risk of heart disease. And statin is a what we call a blockbuster drug. <laughs> blockbuster drug is where the pharmaceutical companies make a lot of money because it it is very, very heavily prescribed. Now let's see how it works. This is an example of a statin. Statin is a common name for, for drugs which lower cholesterol. It's not just one drug, but it's many different drugs which all lower cholesterol, they're related to one another. And here is an example, a very earlier drug, uh, which was used to lower cholesterol or a statin which was uh, used to lower cholesterol. It's called Lova statin or Mavacor was a trade name for this compound or for this drug. And this is the structure of a drug, the structure of that, that drug and, 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 and called Lova statin. Lova statin has very interesting history. If you have time, search for discovery of Lova statin or discovery of statins. It has very interesting history. It was, it was, it was discovered by a Japanese uh, scientist working in a company. They were looking at fungal metabolites 
or the compounds extracted from fungus to see if they lower the cholesterol, if they inhibited this enzyme. So they were screening lots of fungus. They were collecting fungus from everywhere, extracting it like natural product chemists do, and then testing the extract for inhibition of this enzyme. And they came across a fungus which contained that molecule which inhibited that enzyme. Interestingly, the active form of this compound is a ring open compound. If you ring open this cyclic compound, you get an alcohol and you get an acid group because alcohol and acid combine to form an ester. And this is an example of a cyclic ester. The active form of this drug is this structure here. And if you look at this structure here, you will find this green part, which I've written down. The green part has the same structure as mevalonic acid. And I was telling you earlier that to be an inhibitor of an enzyme, the inhibitor will have structure which will be very similar to the actual substrate. So this is your substrate or the product. So in this case, the mevalonic acid here structure is present within the drug molecule as well. And that's how it's able to act as a competitive inhibition. The active form of the lower statin, that is the active form here, is 17,000 times more active or more affinity for the enzyme than the cyclic compound. And it lowers cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, it's called low density lipoprotein uh, cholesterol by 40%. And it reduces heart attacks. And this was the first drug that was approved by the FDA, that's the body in the US which approved drugs in 1987. So it discovered many years ago, 1987. But in 1995, this company here, Merck Pharmaceutical Company in the US was earning $1 billion a year from this one drug alone. Because it's, it's, it's such a big problem, cholesterol and heart disease that is so commonly prescribed. <coughs> And, and once this drug was discovered, then everybody joined in and, and started looking at other drugs within the statin team. But one thing I wanted to show you was that this is the enzyme HMG-CoA, and this ball structure here is the actual substrate bound into the enzyme. And this is the statin that is bound into that enzyme as well. And it's sort of binding at the same place as the as your substrate okay so this is to show that the drug inhibitor is binding uh, at the same pocket as the as the actual substrate and like i said statin is a common name for drugs which are used to lower cholesterol the other companies joined the bandwagon once the drug was found to be potent found to be making money, <laughs> the other companies joined in. Merck came, in with, came up with another drug called um, Zocor as a common name. Uh, Pfizer uh, in 1996 developed Lipitor. Again, the common part within these structures is the mevalonic acid structure. The rest of the part of the structure is different. And this is also called by a trade name called Lipitor. And Lipitor is the most commonly prescribed uh, statin cholesterol lowering drug. And in 2006, the sales for this Lipitor was $14.4 billion, a huge, <laughs> huge, huge drug. And the other company joined in, AstraZeneca produced their own, Bristol Myers Squibb, they produced their own. So <clears throat> that's what drug companies do. Once a drug is discovered, they will develop their own drugs to treat the same condition. Okay, that's, that's about competitive reversible inhibition. What about uncompetitive inhibition where um, there is uh, no competition uh, between the substrate and the, and the inhibitor? And these are also called as allosteric uh, inhibitors. Uh, and, and you can see that the allosteric inhibitor has its own binding pocket here. And the active side of the enzyme is over here. So the substrate binds into that and the allosteric binding uh, pocket 
is taken by the allosteric inhibitor. So it's binding at a different place, not at the active site. So once the inhibitor binds into its own site, it changes the shape of the active site. See, it was broader by binding the inhibitor, it became narrower. So that means the actual substrate is not gonna be able to bind to the enzyme anymore because the shape is changed now. So this inhibitor binds reversibly to the allosteric site, that means the site that is away from the active site. There's intermolecular bond is formed again. And, and this uh, binding changes the shape of the enzyme. The active site is distorted and not recognized by the substrate. And increasing the substrate concentration here does not inverse the effect because it's binding at a different place. An inhibitor is not similar in structure to the substrate because it's binding at a different place. It has its own site. So the structure is not the same. An example of an allosteric inhibitor, um, an al allosteric inhibitor example is a, a mercaptopurine compound. This is a thiol group. An SH group is also called as a mercapto group. And that's why the name um, mercaptopurine. So this is a mercapto or a thiol group and, and or is called a thiol, T-H-I-O-L, a thiol group. And that's why the name mercaptopurine. And it inhibits the first enzyme in the biosynthesis of purines. It blocks the biosynthesis of purine and DNA and it is used in the treatment of leukemia, okay? So this is an example of an allosteric inhibitor, uh, reversible again, but allosteric inhibitor. Okay, so, so it's like I was saying that enzyme targets are the most common in terms of effects of drugs or the targets of drugs. And what I've done here is listed the condition which is being treated by the drug and the enzyme that is involved. So if you look at antibacterial agents, sorry, if you look at antibacterial agents, um, the antibacterial agents typically, we looked at transpeptidase today, which is involved in the synthesis of cell wall, but there is a, other antibacterial agents which are involved uh, in inhibiting the folate synthesis. So these are the enzymes that are involved in a couple of examples of enzymes which are involved as antibacterial agents. There are many other, this is just some examples. Antiviral agents, there is a transcriptase enzymes, there's protease enzymes. Anti-inflammatory, there's cyclooxygenase enzyme. Cholesterol lowering drugs, we just talked about just now. That's the reductase enzyme that is involved. In antidepressants, there is monoamine oxidase involved. And then there are many enzymes involved in anti-cancer agents, anti-cancer drugs that are used. There are a lot of enzymes used there. Anti-hypertension, people with uh, hypertension diseases, there are enzymes involved there as well. Oops, sorry, there are enzymes involved there as well. Um, there are many different anti-gout, anti-ulcer, Alzheimer's disease, diuretics. These are the names of enzymes that are involved uh, in these drugs. So, so many drugs, they target enzymes. That's the point I'm trying to get across. And that's the most common way the drugs show their effect. How are we going with time? We've got still some time. The other place I wanted to, to show you, gives you an example of is proteins as drug targets. We talked about enzymes, but we're gonna talk about proteins because the body has, has proteins and the proteins are very, very important in our structure, in our cell structures. Proteins are made up of amino acids. I think this audience doesn't need introduction to amino acids. Amino acids are the building block for the proteins where these combine together, link together to form proteins. So proteins can have a primary structure where there's just a sequence of amino acids. They can have secondary structures where the amino acids are linked together by amide bonds, but they also have additional hydrogen bonding interactions present within the structure. And these hydrogen bonding interactions can lead to uh, helical structures, sorry, go back, lead to um, helical structures uh, shown by this helix here, or this alpha helix side view here, 
or they can form beta sheets by hydrogen bonding between the neighboring chain. So if there's one chain of uh, amino acid up there, another chain of amino acid up there, you can form these hydrogen bonding between this C double bond O and there is NH, uh, which is present on the second chain. And you can get this hydrogen bonding formation between the two chains and that lead to beta pleated structures. So these are called secondary structures of proteins, the helixes and the, and the, and the sheets. But then there's also what we call a tertiary structure uh, of proteins as well. And the tertiary structure is when there is, you know, there's sheets present, there are helices present within the, within the uh, protein structure. These are big proteins. There are many helices present in it, you can see, and there's sheets present as well. And this is what we call uh, is the tertiary structure uh, of, the, of the protein. The proteins can also have what we call quaternary structure. And quaternary structure is when two or more protein units, they aggregate together. An example is a hemoglobin where the different four subunits here or the four protein units, they combine together by these interactions form this uh, quaternary structure. And the quaternary structures are obviously very important. Tertiary structures are very important in terms of the enzyme action but quaternary structures are important as structural proteins. So I'm gonna show you one example where these structural proteins are important in terms of the drug target. And what we're gonna be talking about is this structure here called tubulin. Tubulin uh, is an example of a, 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 a quaternary structure protein here. And these tubulins here, they can polymerize to form what we call microtubules. And the microtubules are very important when the cell is dividing. When the cell is dividing, they form components of cytoskeleton. When the cell is going undergoing division, these tubulins can form microtubules and they play a very important role um, as being parts of the cytoskeleton. And, and part of cellular process. So if you can somehow disturb this polymerization and depolymerization of this tubulin that is happening, you will kill the cell. And that's how anti-cancer drugs can show their, their effect. So let's look at a couple of examples here. So example of uh, tubulin polymerization inhibition. So if you can inhibit the polymerization of these tubulins, you will have a drug. And, and the name of the drug here is colchicine that is used to treat gout. Vinblastine, which is an anti-cancer agent. And what it does is it inhibits this tubulin polymerization, which is involved in formation of cytoskeleton when the cell is dividing. But very common drug, which is, which is used quite extensively in the clinic is called as a Texol. This drug here is called as a Texol or Paxi, uh, Paxi Texol, and the common name for that is Texol. It has a very complicated structure, right? It's a big molecule, and, uh, and it was initially isolated from a, a yew tree. So it is a natural product. It was isolated uh, from a tree. And what this drug does is it inhibits this tubular depolymerization. So once the tubulin depolymerization is inhibited, the tubules are stabilized and cell division uh, is halted. And if cell division is halted, then the cells cannot multiply. And the cancer cells multiply very fast. And if you inhibit the multiplication of cancer cell, you have an anti-cancer drug. And the important thing is that it's a natural product. It was isolated from a U tree. And that is used clinically to treat cancer. The, the, the portions which are highlighted in, in green here, um, they are involved in binding to tubulin, okay? So, so the acetyl group, the menzoyl group, the side chain, they're all involved uh, in terms of binding to the, to the tubulin itself. So again, I don't want to go into too much details here, but just telling you that this can be also uh, important as well. Okay. 
the well the next <laughs> the next uh, biological targets which we have is uh, cell receptors and the cell receptors are obviously uh, very important drug targets as well okay um and cell receptors are shown as a uh, as a as a diagram here and uh, and these cell receptors um they have a what we call an extracellular domain and an intracellular domain. They span the cell membrane with units on the inside of the cell and the units on the outside of the cell as well. So this is outside of the cell and this is the inside of the cell uh, as a cellular domain. And, and there are many different transmembrane um, units are there. And we're not gonna talk about all of them because it's a, it's a topic by itself. It's a big topic by itself. And a lot of the drugs target this, uh, this, uh, uh, these transmembrane um, proteins or receptors. Just gonna show you one example because uh, just to make it relevant, it's called as a G protein coupled receptor. And this is involved in uh, interaction of many drugs with a target. And a simple example I'm gonna take here is, is hay fever and allergy, because that's very common um, to, uh, to many individuals. You can have the, um, everybody can have allergy. Again, I'm not gonna go into the details here. I'm just gonna move directly into the, into the effect rather than talking about the details of these receptors because they're quite complicated. And, 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 and many drugs they target um, GPCRs, that's the G-coupled protein receptors. Nearly half of all the drug out there, they target this GPCR one way or the other, either as an agonist or as an antagonist. Just one example here, bear with me for a few seconds. Histamine. Histamine is a very common molecule which our body produces as a response to an allergic reaction. So what happens is the H1 is, is what we call is a receptor. It's a GPCR receptor and is activated by this simple molecule histamine, okay? When histamine binds to this GPCR H1 receptor, it causes a, a, a complex cascade of in, in, in events, including a bronchoconstriction uh, constriction, that means we start to get this stuffy nose and we start to get an allergic response when this small histamine molecule binds to a, a GPCR receptor. So anything which can be an antagonist, which can stop the binding of histidine to that receptor, it will reverse the action of that receptor of the histamine binding to the receptor. And that's how the anti-allergic drugs react. Allergy, allergic, anti-allergic drugs, they reverse the action of this histamine binding to the receptor, right? And one example of a drug here is a lotidine. And it basically blocks histamine binding to the H1 uh, receptor. And if the binding is reversed, then it becomes like a drug, right? It becomes like a, a anti-allergy drug, which is available uh, in the market. The other drug which is available in the market also is called Benadryl. You would have heard of that. It's a quite common in Southeast Asian and Asian countries. You can get it as a syrup. And if you compare lotridine with Benadryl, that's the structure of lotridine. And if you compare that to a related structure, which is Benadryl, and, and that is uh, also used as a decongestant or an anti-allergy drug. Lotadine is much more specific than Benadryl. If you look at the binding of this, this lotadine here to H1 receptor, the binding constant is 350 nanomolar. That means it's active at a very, very low concentration compared to Benadryl, which is active at a thousand nanomolar concentration. And also, Panadryl is not specific enough. It's, it also is an antagonist of uh, another receptor, which causes 
sedation and a dry mouth. It also can block sodium channel, which can act as a local anesthetic and also can give uh, abnormal heartbeat. So what I'm trying to say here is that the drug has to be very specific. And if it's specific drug, you get no side effects. And if you take a drug which is not specific enough and has uh, other targets also being affected, then you will get side effects of the drug. And the side effects of this drug here is uh, drowsiness, dry mouth, uh, when you use Benadryl versus taking Lotridine. I think given the time, I think I should probably stop here. And then um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer the questions. I've given you a lot of information, I know, but please go through it in your own time and, uh, and, and, and you will be able to, uh, able to get a lot of useful information, uh, which is very applicable in, in our daily lives where we're taking all these drugs and without even thinking what they do. All we are concerned about is, okay, does it cure me? <laughs> if I feel better after taking the drug, then you don't bother about it anymore. But as scientists, as chemists, uh, you should think a bit more deeply as to what may be happening when we are, we are taking these drugs. And particularly the antibiotics area is becoming very, uh, very um, important these days. Same as antiviral because the infections are on the rise and, and, and the use of antibiotics has also led to uh, antibiotic resistance where many bacteria are becoming resistant to drugs. So, so we need to, uh, need to take a proactive approach in terms of understanding uh, what the effect of drug is without even thinking about when we are taking a drug. All right, I'll just stop here and, and answer any questions which you might have. I'll stop sharing as well so you can um, ask questions uh, and then um, I'm happy to answer it. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Norris. Maybe you can have a drink after yeah. almost thank you, two hours lecture. Yeah. So, I know. yeah. <laughs> Uh, all right, so everyone, if you have any questions, you can ask directly to Professor Norris. And maybe while we are waiting, uh, I would like to inform you, Professor, that we have uh, uh, Bapak Solihin here, Bapak Hayat Solihin. <laughs> He's from UNSW Hi. as well. Uh, hello, Norris. Hi. Hey. Hi. 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 It's nice you to know. meet you. Okay. Nice, <laughs> nice to meet you too. It's we very have, interesting have... lecture. Huh? Thank so. you. Thank okay. you. Okay. Yeah, we'll I go. hope you will come here to Indonesia. I, I, I would love to. I, I went to Gaza Mada three times yeah. already. Yeah. Yeah. Sometime and come to Bandung. Sure. Uh, yeah. Thank you. For <laughs> you the do you remember me? I do now. <laughs> yeah. Oh, how is Professor Beck? How Professor is Professor David Black? David is Black is good. Good, good, good. Yeah, he's good, uh, yeah. he's yeah. working from home now because of the COVID. Oh yeah, I see. But, okay. uh, he does does see us very often. We have a meeting every week uh, with him, so he's still very keen on science and chemistry. Well, okay, it's very interesting. Thanks for your yeah. lecturing here. Yeah. Okay, thank you, thank you, <laughs> and then thanks for your coming to. Okay, yeah, to make yes, your lecture here. I look here. forward to meeting you in person. I think. I yes. I will waiting for you in here in Bandung. <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> I thought you will come to Bandung here that I prepare for serving you in Bandung. <laughs> okay, thank you, thank you, thank okay. you. Thanks anyway for the guy. Yeah. No worries. Okay, see you next time or next week, well, is it? Yeah. Yeah. Next week. <laughs> okay. Thanks yeah. very much. Yeah. Thanks for that. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Bapak Hayat Salihin. All right, uh, maybe is there anyone who wants to ask question? Maybe Iram, if I'm not mistaken, because Iram raised his hand or her hand. Or uh, it's all clear enough. <laughs> uh, maybe something, maybe I have one question, uh, Professor Norris, if I may, like, if we follow all the Lipinski's uh, Lipinski rules, mm -hmm. uh, does it mean that the drug will have uh, will have minimum side effect or 
No, uh, think, or are there any criteria? Yeah, other criteria for drug to have uh, yeah minimum side effects and okay. like that. So the Lipinski rule is mainly used to predict bioavailability of compound, oral bioavailability. When you take a drug, what are the chances whether it will from the oral absorption through the intestine will go to the bloodstream or not? That's the only use of Lipinski's rule because the drug has to get into the bloodstream. If it can't get into the bloodstream, then we are wasting time. Okay. And, and that's why people want to use Lipinski's rule to, to figure out, okay, there's a good chance that it'll go to the bloodstream. But these days, Lipinski's rules are becoming a little bit less important because there are, there's a lot of uh, developments in nanomedicine area where you can you can package your drug into like a, a, a like a like a package which can avoid some of the the consequences of um, stomach and, and intestine and the enzymes and you can deliver the drug in a different way to the target using nanotechnology nanomedicine so and also you'll find that many big molecules they don't follow lipinski rule like the taxol example i gave the anti-cancer compound, it's a huge molecule. And if you, if you try to apply the Lipinski rule to that, it'll fail all Lipinski rules. So, but but that, that drug is not orally bioavailable. That has to be given as an injection because it, it is predicted not to be you know, bioavailable. But with nanomedicine, you can deliver the compound directly at the active site. So that I think uh, some people if they find something which is very useful, they don't worry about Lipinski rule, they can find another way to deliver the drug. But if you want to predict the toxicity or the side effects of the drugs, there are some software available. There is a Swiss, there is a Swiss admin site where you can actually draw your structure and it can tell you a lot of properties of your compound by using that admin. Swiss site and it's free. It's a free website. You can just, but there are also many other commercial software are available as well, which you can buy, and draw your structure and can predict many properties for you. Oh, that's good. Yeah. I see. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Naras. Uh, okay. Any questions? I I want to ask question to Prof. Naris? Uh, sure. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> uh, hello, Prof. Naris. I'm Barik Fauzan from Chemistry. Um, I want to ask about the uh, last slide that, that you uh, said about um, the side effect of a Benadryl. Yeah. There is um, the, the one of the side effects is a blocking the sodium channel. Yeah. So, like, uh, like what I, I've read, uh, Benadryl is about to reduce the itchy allergic, right, Professor? Yeah. So when uh, it's reduced the allergic itchy, but but in other side, it's uh, blocking the sodium channel. Is it uh, more bad, Professor? Or um, I think the, the the there's always a benefit versus side effects. There's you know everything has a certain safety margin, right? We we call that um, the you know, therapeutic index. You, you, the drug is active at, is, is good at curing something at a certain concentration, but if you increase the concentration, then the same drug can be toxic as well. That's why there's a dosage associated with it. Um, so one, one, one point is that the dosage is very important. Dosage is what is the active dosage. And then if you increase it, then you might get start, more side effects than normal. But one of the key things these days when we are developing drug is we always look at what we call a HERG channel, H-E-R-G, HERG channel. And that channel typically tells you if it's going to have a, some sort of effect on the heart uh, in the development of the drug or the, or the, the drug is going to have any effect there or not. And that is done these days quite early in the, in the drug development. And if, it, if you find out the drug is going to interfere in the HERG channel, the chances are later on it's going to cause heart problems. So, so that drug is somehow modified or discarded. Um, but I think the answer to your question is the, the answer lies in the dosage, that what dosage are you taking? 
and uh, and 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 if if it's consumed in in higher proportion then obviously the chances are you might start to get those the those those side effects which are which can be really problematic um but drowsiness is is quite common with taking uh, that antihistamine medication but the effect on the heart channel uh, or 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 constricting the the blood vessels um may not be as severe uh, as 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 um, as say for example um you know drowsiness and the like which is associated with it but you know you have to read the precautions which are there on the bottle <laughs> quite carefully sometimes the drugs have a label to say you know it could have this effect or or, or it could have this side effect and 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 that side effect may not be visible in everybody but it may be some individuals are more affected by it than the others all right doctor uh, all right professor nari thank you for Thanks, your answer All right, thank you. Uh, okay, anyone maybe last question wants to ask to Professor Nares? Um, otherwise, actually, uh, someone messaged me, Professor Nares. Maybe yep. she or his to say, to shy to ask to you. But uh, is there any software that can model interaction between the drug target with the drug candidate with the protein target? Yes, yes, you can. There is a there's many different software packages available. Some of them actually free as well. One is called AutoDoc. You can download it from a website. Um, we in our group has a commercial software we use. It's called Discovery Studio. Uh, so in the Discovery Studio, you can download a structure of a protein. And uh, and then you can take a small molecule and then see how that molecule interacts with that with that protein at the active site. So you can actually do modeling, and you can design new compounds, new drugs, or new new target molecules using that by studying that interaction. So we use uh, we use Discovery Studio, and and there's a software called Gold. We use that, but. Like I said, some software are are available free of charge. If you just do Google search, and Autodoc is one of them, and then another one is called Autodoc Vina. Actually, <laughs> so if you if you if you download that, you can actually um, study a lot of those interactions yourself. Um, and, and and there are some proteins available with the compound bound in there already. So you can do analysis to learn more to so how the compound is binding and what the interactions are, and you can teach yourself um, a lot of those things. And uh, and 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 my students in my group they all study that they all use that software. Modeling is good in a way that you don't need any lab. You just sit in your office and have a computer. <laughs> yeah, a powerful seeing computer the screen. <laughs> powerful computer is better, and then. You know, yeah, and it's easy to do. Somebody, I think, just put a question in the chat. Most of the drugs which we are using in our daily life mostly have side effects for stomach. How we decrease the side effects? That that's a good question. Actually, I was going to talk about a drug, but we ran out of time. Uh, aspirin uh, versus uh, versus non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. One of the thing which aspirin does, I don't know if you know or not, aspirin can cause bleeding in the stomach. So if people who take aspirin every day, because aspirin is, is supposedly uh, thins the blood, so many people who have heart condition they take aspirin every day. But aspirin can cause bleeding in the stomach, while the non-steroidal and anti-inflammatory drugs they don't cause any uh, bleeding in the stomach. So that's where the specificity is very important. And there was a drug which was developed by a company uh, which was supposed to be a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. Um, uh, and and, and it, it had some side effects it was found later on. It, it, uh, it interfered with the heart channel and, and caused um, heart attacks in patients. Um, so, so I think that's where the specificity of the drug is uh, is very very important. Um, um, and 
how we decrease the side effect that the side effects can only be decreased by by developing drugs which are very specific that they only hit the target which you want to hit they only affect the enzyme or the protein which you are or the receptor you are interested in inhibiting if it start to inhibit different receptors then you're going to get a lot of side effects so that's where the specificity of the drug, the selectivity is very, very important to avoid the side effects. Uh, by using more water, taking dose or taking other liquids. Um, I think if the drug is specific and only target one particular receptor, then it doesn't matter how you take it, whether take it with water or it's not gonna make any difference. So I think that's where the specificity of the drug is very important. All right, thank you, uh, Naraes, and to all participants. I think we are running out of time. It's already 3 p.m. here in Indonesia, Bandung, and maybe in Sydney now it's... What? 7 p.m. <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> right, yeah, 7 p.m. And 7 it's PM. <laughs> already winter? Is it? No, sorry, oh, no. Uh, summer is, we are in spring. Oh, no, summer, I mean, yeah. yeah. Sorry, spring. <laughs> spring, yeah. Um, it's nice weather, right, in Sydney, yeah? <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> right. <laughs> we, we just opened up, uh, actually, this week. We were in lockdown for three months. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> on Monday, we opened up, so it's a bit more activity now. Huh? Yeah, <laughs> Okay, yeah, good to know. So... Yeah, I think uh, if no more questions and no more discussion, I think uh, it's enough yeah, for today's lecture. Thank you, Professor Norris, and thank you to all participants. I think we, <laughs> yeah, we will see you again next week, right? Thank you next week. Uh, yeah, and okay. at the same time at 1 p.m. and at the same link. And for next week, especially because... Uh, it will be special because it's uh, our department's webinar and Professor Norris will not be alone because uh, yeah, because he will be accompanied by Professor Harno from Gajah Mada University. So Professor for all participants, Professor Harno? Harno. Oh. Yeah, yeah, Professor Harno from uh, UGM. Yeah, he will accompany Professor Norris. So for all participants, if you want to join, don't forget to register. And yeah, thank you everyone. Thank you, Professor Norris, once again. See you next week and have a good night. Have a good rest, Norris. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Pak Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank yeah. you, everyone. See you next week. <laughs> thank you all. Don't forget to fill out the attendance link and see you next week with the same link. And uh, don't worry because I will send you a reminder every week. So thank you.